Should we get started right. with our slides? Let's do it. So get it pulled up. Karen, you want to walk us through kind of what we're going to be doing today? Sure. So we've got an awesome agenda, everyone. Um, we'll just kind of walk through a little bit about upcoming meetings and go through when we're going to meet next. We'll touch on um, conference and what it's going to look like this year. And um, we got a few points that we just definitely want to get across about how you can attend um, this year and what will be different. And then we have two awesome speakers today and tips and tricks um, from Nelson and Nathan. We also have a Kahoot quiz. Um, we've got Kelly Cronart from covidgeorgia.com. I hope I got that right, but we'll, we'll go through her slides um, in more detail later. But um, she's gonna, she has a great presentation for us on how she's used Tableau to analyze COVID data. So very relevant. And Carl from InnerWorks is going to share with us um, solutions for creating portals in Tableau. So we have a packed agenda. Yes, exciting. Somebody hit record, right? We're good. Yep, hope so. Rock and roll. Keep us going, Karen. What do you got? What's coming up? Okay, for those who may not, yes. For if anyone is not aware, we do have an Atlanta Tableau user group dashboard out on Tableau Public. Um, many of you guys have already seen it, but it's a great place to just uh, see visually upcoming meetings. Um, you can volunteer to speak by clicking on a meeting like that's highlighted in yellow. And you can even view videos of previous meetings and see like just little data facts about like meetings in the past that have already occurred. So you can see here those arrows are upcoming meetings. So in October, um, we've got coming up that shaded part, October 6th through the 8th. That's the Tableau conference. And um, we, we typically do a meeting where we cover some of the best content that we came across in the conference. And we're going to do that in October this year. It will be October 29th which I believe is a little different than our third Thursday typical meeting date. So just something to remember and make sure you have it on your calendar. So look forward to that in October. And we'll also have another speaker um, to talk about Tableau training. Um, we have one final meeting in 2020 uh, in December. We've got a meeting December 10th. And um, so make sure you guys uh, register for that one as well. And Let's see, we have a little bit of content that I want to make sure we cover about the conference. Yes, but before we get there, uh, not everybody may be aware of this, but it is my great pleasure and honor to announce that our co-leader and good friend, Miss Karen Henson, was uh, named a Tableau ambassador for the user groups. So just a big virtual round of applause. I know everybody at home is is uh just celebrating with you karen super uh excited for you very well deserved uh for all the contributions that you've certainly invested into this community here in atlanta and and beyond so we're super grateful for you lawrence is you. there you go the, the, the congrats are coming in thank you thanks guys i it was definitely a big surprise and i'm very humbled and i want to say one thing just that um i really want to acknowledge that atug has three awesome user group leaders and everyone's contributions are just, I personally can't even begin to tell you how much I value and appreciate not only everything you do for ATUG Nelson, but like just your friendship and how you've supported me. It, this year in particular has been just so crazy as a working mom trying to juggle like ATUG and responsibilities along with work and kids. And I just really, I want to make sure I say that and, um, uh, just let you know how much I appreciate you. Absolutely. The feeling is mutual. I think when, when we took this on, I think you and I both kind of said we would not do this without each no. other. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I certainly appreciate that. It's, uh, I'm excited for you. This is going to be great. So uh, grateful for that. Not only grateful for Karen, but also wanted to give a quick shout out to Teron Wilson. Teron is someone who hangs out in, in the background a little bit for us, but um, is responsible. Uh, back when we were doing all of our in-person meetings, he would 
video everything. He's the reason that we've got so many of our, our previous meetings and talks up on YouTube. Um, and we just wanted to give uh, Trent a, a little bit of uh, just celebration. Uh, we've sent him a, a gift certificate over to the Tableau store. Um, but if you've ever watched any video of any presentation dealing with ATUG, uh, Trent's your man for, for making that happen. So uh, just a quick shout out to him. Um, and just and Taran, that'll come in useful because they usually have some pretty cool stuff in the store around conference time. So hang on to that and make sure at conference you check the store out. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and to that point, um, you know, let's talk about Tableau Conference. Karen, you know, you, you mentioned a couple of your favorite, um, you know, events and, and memories, but um, for somebody who's not been to Tableau Conference, it, it's certainly a traditional one, what would you like to tell them about uh, Tableau Conference in general, like just to, you know, something to get jazzed up about. It's definitely an experience just you can't even really imagine until you've gone. Um, you meet so many people. How I, I want to say it's like 17,000 over number of people that are there. And it's just crazy to see so many people who are that excited about what they do for a living and using a software. Um, the speakers are phenomenal and there's just a lot of cool opportunities to like meet others who do what you do and if you're really into tableau like i know many of you are just meeting people that are other in the data fam it's it's really cool because you feel like you really look up to some of these folks and you admire them and you know their work just getting the opportunity to meet people and network is really cool um it's going to look different this year but there's a lot of, of good that will actually come from it being virtual. Yeah, one of the cool things is that uh, Tableau is going to be basically doing a six hour session and then doing three of them back to back to back. So the Americas will have kind of the first shot. Uh, and then what you'll have is kind of the Asia Pacific will then happen. And then after that, the Europe will happen. And so it'd be like six hours here, six hours in Asia, six hours in Europe take six hours off and then do it all over again for three straight days. Um, and I think, you know, the expectation is uh, with, with, with the borderless and it's all free, by the way, that's the other cool thing this year. So, you know, check out, uh, just go to tableau.com or if you can go straight to it, tc20.tableau.com. We'll take you right there. Um, but the coolest part is, uh, you know, we get, we may get thousands, uh, tens of thousands of people more. So we could be talking about 40, 50, 60,000 people that, that may go through this and sign up. So super excited about that. Um, you know, this is, uh, we were looking for a picture of, of, of Anna and we found this one when we went to the <laughs> dolphin thing last year, uh, in Vegas, cause in Vegas, you can do just about anything <clears throat> and you don't have to even tell anybody about it. Cause what stays, what happens in Vegas, just, it stays in Vegas. Um, so this is the date they're talking about. So we're about, uh, what, 19 days away ish. Mm -hmm. Um, so three full days. Uh, it is, uh, if you're on the East coast noon to 6 PM, uh, and you don't have to do the whole thing, uh, but definitely really encourage things like iron Viz, things like, uh, the keynotes, those would be massive. Um, and then apparently there's also some other things that are going on where you've got games and virtual photo booths and tableau store and there's gonna be virtual concerts exactly um, so for those of you that if you haven't been able to attend before i know the cost like it's been prohibitive for a lot of folks like that's definitely a barrier it's kept a lot of people from being able to attend who otherwise would have wanted to and perhaps there just wasn't budget so this year it's free it's a hundred percent free it's all online and just pick and choose what you want to go to but you definitely don't want to miss iron viz make sure you do iron viz um, but they will have if you're familiar with what's usually at the conference they'll have a lot of those typical like things that you can expect like the brain dates tableau doctor um a lot of stuff for the community um and even those little photos with the bubble data you know you've got to have one of those and they're gonna have those so i've even asked about is there a way and i, I don't i don't have an answer yet but i'll share it on our slack channel um if if i hear back but um i'd love to see if there's a way we could get like an a tug photo or a range for like a group you know some of those pictures, like find ways to connect with each other, even though it's virtual, that would be really cool. So I'll keep everybody posted. Well, and Karen, since you mentioned connecting with, with each other because it's virtual, I wanna make sure everybody's aware, and I'll leave this slide up for just a quick second. 
Um, but we've got our ATOG Slack. Uh, so if you've not already joined our Slack community, we'd love to have you join that. That's kind of the real time happenings. Obviously we still have the LinkedIn group and, and we monitor that both of those, those things. Um, but the thing we want to call attention to is that we have opened up a TC20 ish hashtag. Um, and so if you've not signed up, definitely do that. The, the idea here is that we want to live chat the conference, right? So, you know, now, um, you know, I always like to sit next to Mark Jackson um, because he, I always think osmosis, he's going to make me smarter <laughs> while I do it. Um, but then I elbow him and be like, that would be really cool, right? But now I can Slack chat him and be like, hey, Mark, that would be really cool, right? Um, and so I'm excited about being able to bother my favorite people um, all throughout the conference just like normal. So um, definitely would love to see uh, you there. Uh, and I would also say too, like it's virtual, right? So it doesn't even have to just be a tuggers kind of doing this we're going to invite some other folks from the community to to join our slack and um you know see uh just really want to have a good conversation while all this is going on so um the other thing i would say too is, is probably check out the twitter for a tc20 hashtag if you want to see some other folks commenting live um but yeah so those are all things tc20 there may be more things to come so just be on the lookout uh we're super pumped for it uh and with that care do you want to introduce our, our first guest today Next up, I believe it's Kelly, right? Is Kelly it first? Is. Okay, Kelly, I will let you go ahead and pull up your screen. And just while you're while you're pulling it up, I'll kind of do a quick intro. Um, I found out about Kelly just through following Tableau hashtags and everything on Twitter. And she's done a great job just throughout this this entire the pandemic, um, providing some really good insights and information on what's happening specifically in Georgia. So she's definitely someone. Look her up if you can share or, or tell everybody your Twitter handle. That might be cool. So definitely sure. someone. To, yeah, to follow. It's uh, Kelly K Photo um, on Twitter. I use the my existing one. I probably should have set up a new one, <laughs> but it's K E L L E Y K Photo. Um, and uh, so I'm also on Facebook. I have links to both of them at the end. Um, but I'll just go ahead and jump right in here. Um, I feel a little bit out of my element. I am super new to Tableau. <laughs> um, but I will go ahead and share kind of what I've learned and what I've uh, found kind of as a new user diving in um, and trying to make sense out of the COVID data with it. Um, so first of all, I just kind of wanted to give a little background. Um, I'm a numbers person, math. Um, it's kind of my, in my, just in my genes, I guess. Um, and I worked in IT um, in various roles um, and did tech writing as part of that. So back when all this started, I mean, I was nervous like everybody else, seeing the numbers. I didn't really know what was going on. And I would just kind of pull up the numbers every day on the Georgia website, but they didn't have any history. So I just have to try and remember how many cases we had or whatever, and then go back the next day and be like, wait, okay, how many was it yesterday? So then I started screenshotting it. I'm like, this is really inefficient. Um, so I was like, I need to just start writing these numbers down um, in Excel. <laughs> so I started building this Excel spreadsheet and um, it just kind of went from there. Oh, yikes, sorry. Um, and then in early May, and I was just doing this for myself, just because I wanted to understand what was going on. Um, so that I could <laughs> feel like I knew what was happening. Um, and then in early May, there was this article in Forbes um, online that was like, cases have gone up 42% in Georgia. And I was, you know, since reopening. And I was like, what? And I was like, I tracked the data next time. I'm like, that doesn't sound right at all. So I'd kind of dig in because again, I like numbers. So I was like, what that, you know, how can that be right? What are they talking about? <laughs> um, and then I'll get into more of that in a little bit. But then about a week later after like that and some other stuff, I was like, I just need to put this data online. Um, and I have website hosting and stuff. So it was easy to get set up. And I just started copying and pasting basically my graphs from Excel uh, onto the website. And it was about a month later that I wanted to get into some of the county data. And I was like, well, I don't know how to make like a map of Georgia to represent our county data. I was like, with anything I do in Excel, I was like, maybe there's like a Google Sheets like plugin or something for that. And I started trying to figure out the way to do it. And I was like, I think I need to figure out what this Tableau stuff is and try that. Cause I'd seen some other people using it. Um, so I installed Tableau and like an hour later I had a color coded map of Georgia with the cases per county. And I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that's kind of where it went from there. And that was just, I mean, in May um, or June rather. Um, so in May, this was the article in Forbes, you know, the risk of exposure is more than 40%. And it said from April 21st to May 2nd, it's increased 42%. I was like, first of all, those are just 11 random days. And it included days before we even opened, which um, made no sense to me. And I was like, fine, it did increase 42%, the total number of cases in that time period. But I was like, but the 11 days before that, it increased 75%. And 11 days before that, it was 300% increase. So I was like, this has nothing to do with anything. Like this was just, um, you know, just a random cherry pick set of data. And that's kind of what got me really like more passionate about following these numbers and sharing them with people. Because I was like, people can just say anything they want about these numbers and um, freak everybody out. Um, so that was kind of what, partly got this all started, I guess. <laughs> it's just bad math and manipulating statistics. So um, basically the goal with the site, I was like, I just wanna make this easy for people to understand. Um, I mean, numbers and things just kind of come easy to me, but I know they don't for other people. Um, and so I wanted to make it uh, as easy as possible um, for people to be able to make sense out of what was happening. Oh, sorry. Um, and I wanted to avoid anything complex. Like at the time when this started, everybody was using like um, log graphs and these complicated scatter plots and things. And I was like, 90% of people have no idea what any of that means. Um, so it's not something people can just look at and make sense of. And I was like, I want something that people can just see, okay, that's a line going up. That's a line going down. I can understand that. Um, and then just again, like with this, uh, issue uh, with the Forbes article. I wanted some way that I could like refute things when, when stuff came up um, to be able to be like, what is happening? You know, this is not right. Uh, so then the first thing I started kind of realizing and why I switched to Tableau was, um, sorry, oops, clicked the wrong thing here. Sorry about that. Um, the state level versus the local level. Um, and, you know, there was one set of information if you looked at the state, but so many things were happening um, in a specific region or a specific county that it was kind of obscuring it. And we have 159 counties in Georgia. So it wasn't simple, like in Arizona, they have like 11 counties. So it'd just be easy to, you know, show the data <laughs> in a lot of different ways. But with 159, I'm like, really, I need a map to make sense of this. So that's where Tableau came in really handy. Um, and I got incidence rates for cases over the last two weeks put on a map so that people could see where it was kind of a hotbed right then as opposed to cumulative numbers. Because um, a lot of Metro Atlanta peaked, but other areas peaked at completely different times. So um, since testing has varied so much, cases aren't necessarily the greatest metric. So just kind of going by when deaths peaks to give you an idea, like in Albany, I mean, it peaked in early April. Um, the Atlanta Metro kind of had two peaks, um, but then we had like early May was Hancock, late May was Habersham, you know, LaGrange was in July, like, and it just kind of went to different spots where it made sense. I really need to be able to highlight different places at different times to show people what was going on. Um, and then the limitations of the data we have um, became a big uh, issue that keeps kind of growing. Uh, there's a report date versus the actual date. Um, and that is, you know, based on like for symptom onset for a case or hospital admission or date of death, it's completely different as to whether, um, you know, you're looking at when it's reported by the state versus when it actually happens. Uh, and then, you know, the testing data we have is limited to only electronically reported tests. So there's a lot of tests that don't get reported. Um, so, I mean, there's quality issues with our data that kind of have to be taken into account when I'm analyzing it. Uh, the testing data also uh, includes multiple positives for the same person. So that skews the positivity. We actually had an issue with that yesterday. Um, incidence rates are also skewed by how timely they're reported. Like we had an issue a few weeks ago where we reported a ton of tests that were more than a month old. So obviously that skews what you're getting. So there's a lot of just data quality things that have to kind of be sorted out. Um, we also didn't have a lot of stuff on the website that from Georgia that we now have um, 
some of the things that I added to my site now that are appeared on the DPH site, which is nice, which is like the county-based incident rates, um, testing volumes, positivity rates, age-based information, which at the time when they first started posting that, I was like, oh, that's neat, age-based data. Um, I'll check that every now and then. And it started to become obvious pretty quickly. Oh, that's changing on a week to week basis, the, the percentages there. So I'm like, I need to pay a little more attention to that. Um, so uh, let's see, hope that's um, making sense. Um, Let's see, uh, then county level maps and data. So this is where I started putting stuff in a map. This was the very first thing I did in Tableau was um, this active cases per 100K. Um, well, I had it actually both the raw numbers and the per 100K. Um, and then new case changes. Um, I added that at some point when somebody had asked me, well, where is it growing versus where is it going down this week kind of thing. And then daily new cases um, per 100K, it's a seven day average. And that's based on a metric from Harvard as to whether you're in like low, medium or high risk. And when somebody first asked me to add this, we were basically all red. And I was like, what good is a map of Georgia that just shows everything red? Um, so I kind of drug my quick. feet on adding that. Tell you real quick, as you're going through this, uh, uh -huh. the, the crowd would be really interested to know where you're getting your data and if it changes as you go throughout kind of the, the time. Oh, sure. Um, so love to have you uh, kind of give us a little bit of that context as well. Sure. I should have, um, all the data I get is from the Georgia DPH website um, for the most part, I would say. Um, they have a pretty good COVID um, dashboard. Like I said, it, the first it was pretty limited. They've added a lot to it. Um, it has some um, CSV files that I can download with the county level data plus the um, overall state data. I just record um, off the site. And then there's a couple other places that I go to that have some kind of additional uh, behind the scenes um, stuff. They have, and I link usually to most of that stuff, I link to it on my website where you can also see like the hospitalization data now has two different dashboards where that's available. Um, and there's another person who's actually done where he actually scrapes data off the graphs that are on the website. And so um, I use that for some of the things, um, the data that otherwise I'd have to like be manually getting out of their graphs. He's able to pull it down and crunch it and post the numbers <laughs> where I can download it as a CSV again. Um, so I have Excel spreadsheet and an access database um, that I track it all in um, going back to the beginning. And that's what I have hooked up to Tableau then. So and these are just some of the graphs and visualizations I have on the website. Um, I mentioned the hospitalization. So um, at first we just had the COVID patients, people that tested positive. Um, then I added on the uh, patients that are under investigation, they call it. Um, once they started, once they added that additional dashboard and I could get the historical data there. Um, and I did it with the stacked um, graph like this. So you can look just at the COVID patients if you want, or you can look at the overall, anybody that has COVID or might have COVID uh, in Georgia. So it's been going down a lot. We kind of hit a little plateau last week. I'm not entirely sure that wasn't just some reporting changeover they were doing from what I'm hearing, um, but seems like we might be headed right back down there again. Um, the deaths, like I mentioned, um, whether you use report date or when the actual date of death occurred. Um, I have these two graphs um, top and bottom like this on the site so that you can see the difference um, of how, you know, the reporting sometimes doesn't necessarily capture what really happened. Um, so deaths peaked in Georgia um, August 7th and I have the amount here so you can see. Um, and then this last 14 days is always um, incomplete. So that's why I have it kind of shaded there. Um, but you can see with the reporting, it's not necessarily telling the same story. And like this one here in um, mid-June, if you look, there's um, this big spike in June. Everybody's like, oh no, deaths are increasing. And I was like, no, they're not. Um, if you look at the deaths by date of death, I'm like, all these deaths that they're adding were way back in April. They're just filling in. So, you know, they're underreported early on and then they add to it later. Um, 
Then this is the one of the latest things I added. Uh, GEMA had been putting out um, a situation report every day uh, and they just recently stopped that. And one of the things people really liked from it, they were mostly just kind of re restating what was on the DPH website. Um, but one of the things apparently that people really appreciated from it and that they were very upset when GEMA took, took it away was the daily they would show like the most, you know, the highest affected counties by new cases, the top 20 or 25 or whatever. So when they took that down and people started panicking, I was like, well, I have that data. I can post that. So I have it where you can click on a county to see it. And I have the counties color coded by hospital region, which is how we have the hospital data broken out. So you can see the total number of cases and the new cases, um, same with deaths and hospitalizations for each county, or I have it in a table that you can sort um, as well for all the counties, not just the top 25 or whatever. Um, then weekly metrics, I do like a weekly report. So I have some different graphs for that where you can see um, these are our cases and these are testing numbers. We had a while here where we had only estimated testing because they were mixed with antibody tests. So I had those a different color. So you can kind of know those aren't necessarily the accurate. We, we kind of had to guess on what, what the testing was there. And then I also have the percent positive um, because again, some of our testing is underreported, but this test, this percent positive tells us um, what we know as far as the tests that we do have the data for. Uh, then this is a COVID cases. I have it graphed again by the orange dots are by when it actually happened, when you either got your test or when the, when the symptom onset was. Um, and then the blue uh, lines are when it was reported. So you can see um, in early July, we were way under reporting our cases because people were getting tested, but those tests were taking a long time to come back. So by the time all that data came back and we filled it in, we found out, oh, okay, we were way under reporting um, on the way up and then on the way down, then we end up way over reporting as we're catching up on that backlog. So it wasn't as obvious that things were falling uh, at first. Uh, and then it, again, like deaths, they get reported, you know, over time. So I started capturing at the end of each week, um, how many deaths got reported that week from the previous week, from the week before that, and then from any prior week. So, um, you know, you can see that first week is kind of predictive of what it's going to be um, as it's going up here and then it started going down. Um, but obviously the final numbers end up um, a lot more about three times, give or take, what's reported that first week. And then uh, this is just another way to see um, how that graph of deaths over time changes. Um, each week I take basically a seven day average um, graph and then I just add on you know, each successive week. So you can see this peak on August 7th. We were already kind of seeing a hint of that here, um, August 15th, the yellow line. Uh, and then it kind of kept going up over the following weeks there. But you can see now we're on a pretty good decline. And again, these initial values are too low, but they are kind of predictive of where it's going to end up. And this is another one of the later things I've added. Um, I wanted to be able to show cases, hospitalizations, death data, but all of which have totally different scales on the same graph. So I did it as a percent of the peak. Um, so you can see first cases and then ER visits with COVID symptoms peaked um, in early July. And then mid-July hospitalizations and new hospitalized cases peaked. And then in August is when deaths peaked. You can see that time lag between cases to hospital to death, um, all on the same graph versus normally if you graph the cases and deaths, the deaths are such a tiny line at the bottom on the same scale, you, you know, and then if you use a dual axis, you have to come up with some number. Um, so I thought this way kind of shows them all. This is just where they got to the max that they are and where they start falling from there. Um, some of the other questions I've uh, had to kind of deal with how to present the data was either um, case data, either presenting it as raw cases or the per capita, like per 100K rates. Um, the raw cases obviously shows where the highest numbers are. And that, I mean, that's pretty much always been, I mean, since 
mid April or so been uh, the Atlanta metro counties uh, because they're the biggest by far. Um, but that obscures big outbreaks in small counties. So there's kind of two sides of it. The big metro counties are also going to be where you have the most deaths because you had the most cases, um, again, in raw numbers. Um, but, you know, it makes large counties kind of appear worse than they are. And then small counties kind of get hidden and don't appear as bad as they might be. Um, so the per 100K lets you see the hot spots in those smaller counties, but then it does have some issues where some counties in Georgia are so small, they have just, a, I mean, a few thousand people that the smallest outbreak can make huge per capita numbers. Um, we also have counties where the infected populations aren't necessarily in the census counts. We're seeing that in the colleges now, which is why Clark County is um, all lit up in Bullock, um, Statesboro. Um, but also counties with prisons, uh, Fort Benning, we have the same issue because uh, all the recruits. Quick, quick question mm -hmm. for you, so sorry. Sure. I hate to interrupt. I'm not sure I entirely understand this question, but I'm just gonna read you um, okay. one that we just got. And actually, we, yeah, what reference was used to create hospital regions? Um, that is a Georgia designation. Uh, I don't know who in the state of Georgia comes up with that, but that is how they present the hospital numbers to us. And so I just captured what, what regions they define um, and organize it that way. <laughs> um, so yeah, they, they're somewhat arbitrary. I'm not entirely sure how Georgia came up with them, but um, that's, how, that's how the numbers are presented to us. We can't see on a county level basis, the hospitalizations. We can only see it by you know, region D, which is Fulton to Cab and Gwinnett, I believe. Um, so that's why those, that's where those numbers or uh, regions came from. Um, but yeah, again, Fort Benning, I think I was saying, um, they have these, you know, recruits come in and they're all, I mean, young and healthy. They've had a lot of cases, but it, this census, the population of Chattahoochee County where Fort Benning is, is impossibly small. So um, the numbers there keep growing, but it's not really showing um, what you necessarily think. <laughs> Okay, sorry, one mm -hmm. more question. No problem. Um, all right, this is about the county data. Do you uh -huh. remove the non-county data? Um, like non-Georgia counties or unknown counties? We have, there's two categories. They have an unknown and they have a non-Georgia resident. And I treat those basically just like counties, like, other than that they don't appear on the map. I debated a couple okay. different ways to do that. Um, but it always ended up weird where it looked like they were just floating off in the ocean or something. Um, but they are in the tables and I do report on those numbers, but we were using those numbers a lot as things were peaking. I think we were using them as kind of a dumping ground for things we didn't know where to put them. Um, and then we'd pull cases back out of there and organize them to counties later. Um, but their numbers there have not been changing a lot for the most part. Although yesterday we did have a bunch of non-Georgia cases get dumped in again. Um, that is a good question. Uh, then the next issue, this is one that's kind of more of the, the math nerd in me. <laughs> um, there was a question at some point that somebody had posed on Twitter about how uh, I calculated percent positive. And uh, it was a great question. And I was glad that I felt like I had the right answer. Um, so, and I actually do it differently than the state of Georgia. So um, I've asked them about why they do it this way. So I'll go over both ways. Um, the state of Georgia does an average percent positive. In that case, each day is weighted equally. Um, so I have an example here, you know, six of the seven days, you have a hundred tests and you have like four, five or six percent positive. But then on the last day of the week, you have a thousand tests with 20 positives. So that would be only 2% positive. Well, if you just add up all these percents, you get 32% divided by seven days, that gives you 4.6% positive, where again, each day is weighted equally. But if you consider that each test be weighted equally, um, you get 50 positive tests out of 1,600 tests, and that gives you a 3.1% positive. Um, this is how the CDC says to calculate it and how some other states I know calculate it. This is how the White House calculates it. It's kind of intuitively just how I set it up originally. I was like, well, it's however many tests, you know, we did in seven days and however many positives we had in those seven days. But 
um, for whatever reason, Georgia does it by just, you know, dividing the seven positive or uh, percent numbers up and dividing by seven. Um, but uh, so you can kind of see why that, you know, some of the, the logic behind the calculations there makes a difference. Um, this is one I included uh, somebody I had shared about this trying to just, again, I'm trying to just kind of present the data we have and make sense out of it. Um, and, you know, when I posted this um, on Twitter, somebody was like, oh, this is a great example of how to lie with statistics. And I, I don't necessarily think it's lying, but I do think it presents two very different pictures. So I thought it would kind of be good to mention. Um, this is from the, a, uh, the HHS site um, the federal government has um, showing, and this is data is from a few weeks ago, but again, this is kind of when this came up. And so I just kind of saved the example. Uh, the, they report it based on the percentage of beds that are occupied by COVID patients out of your total beds for the state. And they do some estimates. So I'm not entirely sure how accurate their numbers are. Um, but they were saying Georgia had like 26% of our beds filled with COVID patients. And, you know, other uh, states were all much lower. So you can see where Georgia's like dark purple on this map and everybody else is a lot lighter, um, which obviously presents kind of a scary picture for Georgia. Um, but I was like, that just seems crazy because I know what the case data is like for these other states. And I knew, I'm like, we can't be that different than everybody else. Um, so I looked at it and according to their data, um, Georgia had a lot fewer hospital beds per capita than any of the other states. Um, so I downloaded their data and added in the populations for each state and instead did it per capita. And then Georgia, instead of being number one, we were fourth and we were like much closer to some of the other states that were also peaking around that same time. Um, so again, it's two, I mean, I think they're both valid ways to present the data, but they definitely tell a very different story. Either we're much worse than everybody else or we're kind of about the same as other states that are, you know, not, you know, with high cases and high hospitalizations at the time. Um, so it's still not a great story, but, and really the bigger issue then is why do we have so many less beds? <laughs> One more question. Sure. Okay, Kelly, sorry. So Mark Jackson is asking if you've mm -hmm. looked at the correlation between positive results at whether positive tests in younger people are a leading indicator of hospitalizations and admissions in older people. Well, we've seen, um, we had a lot of cases in younger people this summer. Um, and, you know, we saw somewhat of a wave where we had more cases in the younger and then more in the older. But then as school started back up, then we started seeing more cases in younger uh, people again. So it's been kind of hard to say exactly. Um, and again, these are also affected by report date. We don't get that age level data based on when the cases actually happened. Um, But I do every week make a note of the, the age stratification of our cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. And there are some fluctuations there. Um, but I haven't seen anything enough to, to really kind of say definitively what's going on. I will say in August, um, early August, we had a lot of cases in young people as schools were starting back up, um, like in the very uh, young people, I mean, like teenagers. Um, as opposed to like young adults. And so deaths right now are dropping off faster than cases because, um, you know, we're about a month out from that, where if it was, if that bump in early August had been older patients, we would be seeing more deaths now than we are. So some people are like, how come deaths have dropped off so much? I don't believe what's going on. Um, people that are a little more pessimistic about the data. But when I've looked at it, I'm like, well, it makes sense to me because those early August cases had a lot of much younger people in them. Um, so again, we're kind of still too early to know weeks after that necessarily what might have happened. Um, these are just kind of um, some of the tips and things I've keep coming across that kind of like make me a little crazy sometimes. <laughs> um, but I thought would be some things I would just kind of share. Um, I just said like sanity check everything. I've seen a lot of people that post stuff um, or either they're posting their own graphs or they're reacting to their graphs. 
And it's a matter of somebody just didn't look like that number makes no sense at all. There's no reason why that number would be so out of whack. Like instead of just posting it and assuming weird, it's super high today, like digging in and going, well, why is that? So that's why I also have like investigate, you know, anomalies and outliers instead of just like, oh gosh, it must've been terrible today. Like, let's dig in. Like, was it really, or, you know, what it makes no sense that that number would have gone up when everything else is going down, those kind of things. Um, and I've just seen a lot of people, you know, with the confirmation bias issues. And I try, I mean, that's, anybody's going to have that. I try as much as possible. Like, I mean, I have a pretty optimistic view of things. So when I see numbers that look really good, um, I try to say like, okay, does that, you know, is it just because it's a low day? Is it a weekend? You know, why would this number be? lower than I was expecting. Um, but I've also seen on the opposite side, people that are, uh, are more pessimistic, a big number will come up and they're like, oh, they see, it must be terrible. And I'm like, again, like, let's dig in and see what's going on here. Um, instead of just going, oh, that, you know, that's what I think should happen. And so let's just jump on it. Um, it's, again, with the sanity check, like don't over rely on automation. I've seen a lot of stuff that just gets pushed live like on the dph site we've seen this um and i've seen other people i had a graph somebody had posted and um with said what he was like well the median here is whatever and i was like six or something and i was like almost all the data is under six like there was a bar graph you could see all the data was like heavily weighted to the small numbers and there was like nothing after six i was like i can just tell visually like the median of that is not six and when I went back and forth, them eventually was like, huh, it must have been my program, it must have been calculating wrong. And I was like, again, that's where you can, if, you know, sanity check it, you know, not just rely on whatever the computer spits out must be right. Um, you know, make sure that you put in the right inputs and that it did the right calculations. And um, so, and then again, don't jump to conclusions. I keep seeing people a lot of this of like, when there is like, couple times when there's been mistakes where I'm like, obviously somebody just pushed the wrong number to the DPH site or something strange happened. Um, my, my general rule is it's probably not a conspiracy. It's probably a mistake. Um, just because I've worked in IT for a long time, I know things like that happen a lot. Yeah. This is excellent, Kelly. I'm so sorry. Oh, uh, oh we're we, running up. Okay. No, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. Oh no. Take, yeah. A few more minutes. Um, okay. thank you. This is really good content. I I'm had so my, my clock up here trying to keep an eye, but I guess. I <laughs> no, I think everybody loves it and really appreciates like just all these good questions that you're asking and like the way that you've approached it, the insights are awesome. So, but continue I'm, just, yeah. There's just like two slides. So I think we're good here. I'll wrap it up here. This is just, I thought was interesting, a projection. Um, of somebody I follow on Twitter, and he's actually one of the people that has the CDC projections he submits to the CDC. So this was the IHME projection that recently came out that said we were gonna have like 400 and something thousand deaths before the end of the year or something. And a lot of people um, were like, how could that even be possible? That shows deaths start going up almost immediately and nothing indicates that. Well, sure enough, they're already like two weeks in out of their confidence interval. Whereas YYG, um, he has a name I can't pronounce, so I just, but um, it's been going down almost exactly like his line would indicate his projection, and it's because he's followed the data. He hasn't followed, well, uh, you know, his, his thoughts on what he thinks it's going to do. He's just followed, well, the data says this is what it's been doing, and it, um, so I just think that's been a really good to see, and he's changed his mind on some things about how much better or worse he thinks it's going to be because he says, well, this is what the data says. Um, and then this was just kind of humorous to me. This, <laughs> um, Cobb County put this out. Um, so I, I didn't feel too bad since it's not a specific person, but, um, they have June and then July, the numbers for hospitalizations get bigger. And then August, it gets smaller again, but they put a linear trend line on it showing hospitalizations just getting worse, which made zero sense to me whatsoever. So that was again of like, let's do a sanity check on this. Like, does that trend line really represent the trend that the data actually is following? <laughs> um, and then that's it. So um, sorry, I kind of went a little long here, but I hope that that was really informative and I'm definitely on Twitter um, all the time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've got 
data posted to my website daily and a weekly update. So if anybody's interested, definitely check it out. Thank you so much, Kelly. Like, I think I speak sure. for everyone. Like, we really enjoyed this presentation. It was super interesting and just great job with everything that you're doing. Thanks for what you're doing. I feel like this whole time, it's really hard to find this type of data. Like, you just don't know who to trust with some of this stuff, even the news. And your site has, is a really good resource. And it's hard to believe that you just found Tableau and you're able to do all this. So great job. Yeah, I, I, I still feel a little um, out of place <laughs> presenting on it, but uh, you did I really awesome. am quite new to all of this, but it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. And I'm like constantly going, whoa, look at this, you know, and like pulling in data and making even things that don't necessarily make it to the website, but for my own use to be able to look at the data and, you know, model things different ways and see what I'm, see what's happening. So, yeah. Thank you well, so thank you much very again. much for having me. Yes, thank you for being here. And I saw a few questions come up from folks. Uh, will we get the slides and share the slides? And Kelly has provided her slides. So um, in our follow-up thank you email after today's meeting, we'll be sure to share these with the group and um, you'll be able to look through these some more. Next and definitely up, hit me up on Twitter. So oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, be sure to follow Kelly. I think Kelly takes away anybody's, um, you know, saying that they can't present, you know, hey, I don't have enough experience in, in Tableau or anything. Kelly, you, you've taken away all of our excuses. That we've done yeah, no, I, if, if I can present on Tableau, <laughs> anyone can. <laughs> no, you, and you had some great stuff. I mean, I saw some fairly complicated table calcs in there and, and some other things that, uh, you know, are Jedi moves for sure. So um, really uh, both proud of you and just uh, that's, amazing that you you've given us such a great resource and such a gift uh, well thank you to, be able to see and understand the data that's amazing yes definitely thanks again and next up I want to introduce Nelson and Nathan who are going to share some design tips and tricks today you guys will love some of this stuff I don't want to give away too much but I saw a little preview and it's it's going to be pretty cool awesome Nathan you want to take us away yeah, sure thing. Yeah, so one of the things that we wanted to focus on uh, today is to kind of give you guys some tips and tricks on the design side and some of the ways that we approach designing dashboards. Um, and so we, we like to take the, the whole concept of wireframing from kind of the software development world and create mockups or wireframes. Um, you can see here on the left, we have kind of a low fidelity wireframe that by low fidelity we just mean you know kind of not great uh, whiteboard style uh, this could be pen and paper this could be you know, we've done it on you know just in PowerPoint with some boxes and like some words um, but uh, and then on the bottom right you can see something that looks a whole lot more like something you'd create in Tableau and so this is uh, this was created in Figma, actually, combined with, you know, using some dummy data in Tableau to generate the charts and that sort of thing. Um, but you can see here, this is a project that Nelson worked on, lots of kind of chicken scratch and clients saying, hey, I want this. What if we could do this? What if we could do this? And we take all that information and we put together a wireframe um, that ends up, it's surprising, actually. So it really kind of comes down to the whole um, start with why and um, and begin with the end in mind, right? Because if we want to if we want to uh, create a successful outcome, we have to know where we're headed. And it's actually really surprising how um, the finished dashboard looks so much like a high fidelity wireframe because we've already defined what that successful outcome looks like. Um, and so Nelson's got this slide here. Um, on Figma, this is a tool that we use to create those wireframes. I was just gonna kind of give you guys an example of, of a dashboard that we recently completed and kind of my personal workflow uh, to get stuff from Figma into Tableau and vice versa. So uh, Nelson, if you wanna pass it back to me, sweet. Thank you, sir. All right. <clears throat> so this is Figma. It, feels a lot like a Google product. It's pretty intuitive, but you basically create a new um, project and then within a project you create 
a little uh, design. And so you start out total blank slate. If you're familiar with uh, Photoshop or any of those types of tools, it works in kind of a layered format and you can drag and drop layers up and down. Um, and so usually what I'll do, and actually the, the, my favorite thing about this is that the, um, the pixels and the placement of the items works so similarly to Tableau. So I can drag, let's say, so usually what I'll do is I'll say, okay, well, what format are we going to build this dashboard on? Is it mobile? Is it desktop? Is it laptop? You know, what, what's the goal here? And so usually what I'll do is I'll say, okay, the X needs to be at zero. The Y needs to be at zero. The width, uh, let's say we want to do 16 by nine. So like a PowerPoint size. So 1600 by 900. Oops. And then we end up with this, this box here that kind of becomes the, the background and we can, we can change the color and add a, um, add a border, that type of thing. And what I can do that now, and this is what I'd recommend doing is locking this. So in the upper left hand corner, I can lock this and I'll call this like uh, background or, or frame is usually what I call it. Um, and then from here, we can start dragging boxes and text and all kinds of cool stuff onto here. Um, and what's neat is you can, you know, Tableau doesn't have a whole lot of options for us in terms of rounded corners, but if we need rounded corners, we can create them quite easily in Figma. And, you know, let's say we want to create some bands across the top, and then we're going to have a you know, some section down here that explains, you know, maybe it's a big map, who knows, right? And so you can play with it, come up with your design. Um, I'll show you an example of one. Um, and so this is a, a dashboard that where we created a kind of a medium high fidelity. Sorry, I'm a little crazy with my zooming here. Um, mock up here. And so you can see all these, you know, took the client's logo, which I've kind of masked a little bit for the sake of this presentation, um, but took that, drew some lines, took their colors and, and created some little boxes for the, for the bands, the, um, this little shading that we've got going here. This is really just two different groups of, of rounded corner boxes, color different things and offset slightly. And so you can get real creative with how you wanna do this. Obviously you could create some of this stuff in Tableau itself. So you could use a, a blank and you know, make it five pixels tall, 600 pixels wide, and you'd have this yellow line. But you know, sometimes it's nice to be able to, to have the background uh, as a template. And so then what we'll do is now that we've got the wireframe and it's, it's all kind of designed, the client says, yeah, I love it. It's gonna look so great then all I do is strip out all of the, the numbers and text and charts and graphs and things. And we're left with kind of this, this background layer that we can drop right into Tableau. Uh, and so I'll show you, I took all the layers of this, grouped it into what uh, Figma calls a frame and then exported the frame. So when I click on the frame, I can export that frame. See down here in the bottom, right? at 2x pixels or 1x pixels. I would recommend when you're working and like deving, building the, the worksheets and floating stuff around, use the 1x because Tableau does not get super happy about super high pixel uh, density images. But then right when you're done, before you publish it to Tableau server or Tableau online, I would recommend at least doubling the pixels. Um, and so we just export that as a PNG and then drop that as a background image in Tableau. And so you can see here, if I go to my layout side, make this a little bigger. Uh, so this, this dashboard is almost entirely floating. Uh, I do have a bunch of containers and containers within containers, collapsing containers, all that good stuff. But at the very bottom of this item hierarchy, I've got my background and and even it can be floating as long as you float it at zero, zero, and then um, set the height and width appropriately. So 
Um, another cool thing we did in this one is use collapsible containers um, to give the user some, some input, some toggles, that type of thing. And so this appears like a little modal window that's popping up and I hit the little X and it goes away. All those parameter values get captured and the data is updated. Um, another thing we used was parameter actions to give the user the ability to toggle between some different charts, which that was pretty fun. Um, but yeah, it ended up looking strikingly similar to our initial mockup. So yeah, Nelson, anything you want to add to that, buddy? Uh, guys, we do have a question. You, you guys mind if I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. All right, so we got a question from Hannah. Does having a background image prevent your dashboard from being responsive on other devices? Yeah, so you would definitely want to create, uh, so let me just show you. I actually, the Tableau folks will tell you Tableau is not responsive. That, that's not a word that they like to use. There are instead different layouts that Tableau allows you to create. And so I got rid of the mobile layout because the, for the purpose of this dashboard, no one was going to be opening up on mobile. Uh, it's an on-prem Tableau server that, you know, it's all kind of locked down and, you know, there, there was really no, no desire for that. Um, but so if, what you would need to do though is in Figma, you would need to create one background layer for each layout. That you, so let's say you did an iPad layout then you'd want to create a iPad shaped um, view. And then, um, yeah, so we would just say, um, I don't know if we have enough time to, to get into this, but we would create a, a new layout for iPad and for mobile. And then we'd have three different background images that serve as the background. And then you actually would even need to drag and drop the, the elements of the dashboard. Uh, onto those layouts so that they make a lot of sense. So hopefully that helps. Cool. And I will steal the screen from you. I know we don't have too much time, but just share. Just FYI, uh, though, there were, it seems like there was a lot of interest in um, some of those tricks. So we should perhaps consider doing like a whole thing on design. Great job, Nathan. Thank you. Yeah. And one thing, Nathan, I don't know if you mentioned, I, was, I have a little technical difficulty over here, but um, one of the things I love about Figma is you can write little notes off to the side. It's one of the big things I think is a differentiator between that and PowerPoint is like, if, if you're kind of capturing notes, you kind of want to draw attention to something. If you do it in PowerPoint, you, you only really have the comments, but like if you want to draw attention to like particular things, so you can kind of take notes and then it's collaborative. So mm -hmm. you can take some notes, you know, you, you're, uh, the different people on the team can kind of take notes and everybody's notes are all kind of in the same design space. So it's super cool. Um, so real quick, wanted to just show, you know, once you've made something cool in, um, in a Figma or again, PowerPoint works, uh, but you know, Figma is kind of fun for all the reasons Nathan just showed. Uh, so we got on this one, we've got our, our little background here. This is an actual Tableau dashboard. Uh, one of the things that, uh, the client that we were building this for wanted the ability to do was kind of say, Hey, you know, we serve a bunch of different clients. You know, we want to be able to change out the colors, um, on this. And so, you know, we, we kind of thought about, well, you know, how could we kind of help create a little bit more of a custom experience, right? So if I'm Home Depot or if Home Depot is my customer and I want to use that Home Depot orange um, and kind of change out the name, right? So we're using a little parameter right here and then we're using a background color. And what's happening is you've got these things that are floating here and then this is kind of a transparent piece that's back here. Um, and so it's, it's kind of highlighting, now it's not changing everything. Um, you know, that would probably be a whole nother level of, of something, but um, you know, if we're, if we're Coke, for example, right. Um, so, uh, Coca-Cola. So, you know, a couple of different, just kind of interesting ways of, of creating a, a more, um, you know, just interesting user experience, you know, for folks, uh, so you kind of can welcome people into something that's gonna, that that's gonna look uh, contextual to, to the environment and so forth. The user experience is really about, um, creating something that people want to use, not something people have to use. Uh, and so it's, it's a big approach that we take here. And uh, we've done some other kind of cool, fun things uh, with this where we kind of have, you know, some, some multi-select parameter type of things that are happening and so forth. Um, the other thing I would say too, real quick, um, is if you wanted to do something like this, the, the, the quick and dirty is that this is a 
super dead simple data set. It's a hundred rows worth of data. Uh, so if I showed it to you real quick, it would just be literally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way down to a hundred. Um, and then if we come back, uh, what we're doing is just doing rows and columns based off of that. So uh, if I show the header of the rows and the columns, uh, a lot of people don't know that this, um, that this function is in Tableau. There's something called a, uh, a I always mispronounce this, but a, a, a modal, uh, which is basically the remainder of a, a, a division. So uh, subtract one and take that out. And so you get kind of a zero, one, two, three, four. Uh, as far as what the remainder is. And then uh, to get our rows, you just kind of come in here and do, uh, you divide by whatever and then take the integer of that. That'll basically fool your numbers. Um, and so that's kind of the, 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 the trick there. And then we just use uh, color, we just set default properties. So you can actually select, you know, hey, anywhere that this, this color shows up, any, anywhere you come in and just kind of say, these are the colors that I want to show. And, and I kind of just went through and just picked a bunch of random colors to try to get a, um, a nice sampling of different things so that we would kind of cover off on different stuff. So um, that's how we did that. And then the, 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 the trick is done by, by taking that and creating a background, right? So this is just a big old bar chart and that consumes the entire thing there uh, by, by extending it out the size. And then that, that sits behind everything. Um, as far as it goes with our with our layout. So um, all sorts of fun stuff. Again, I think we could talk about these types of little hacky things all day, but uh, super fun. So just thought we'd throw, give you a couple ideas to noodle on uh, potentially if, uh, if this is stuff that's uh, interesting to you. Cool. Awesome. Nathan. It's time to Kahoot. Time to Kahoot, my man. All right. Guys, this is everyone's favorite time of the user yeah. group i don't know i don't know if that's true actually that's my favorite all right so if this is your first time it's uh it's pretty straightforward you go to kahoot.it or download the kahoot app enter this pin put your name there and we're gonna it's basically like trivia we're gonna have some tableau related questions some tableau conference related questions and the winner, I believe, will get some type of swag. So, you definitely want to play. We'd love to see who's going to win today. All right, so we'll give you a few minutes to, to get in there. Tend to turn the color of the screen. That's fun. So I was looking a little like uh, Smurfy there a second ago. All right. So we got 140 people on the call. There are 63 players about ready. If you want to join? We got. 20 more seconds, go. And unfortunately, normally I'm joined by Anna Ford. She is teaching a Tableau class on the West Coast and unable to join us. Nelson, are you gonna be my co-host here? Or are you? Okay, you just turned off the video. Okay, that's fine. Here we go. Are you guys ready? We're ready. All right. Welcome to Kahoot. You have 30 seconds to answer. Oh, no. So the first one is a poll. So what is your preferred duration of an ATUG virtual meeting? There's no right answer here. We just wanted to get an idea of what's the right. Just collecting answer. feedback. Yeah, collecting some feedback. Hey, Karen, why don't you come on and be my co-host? Come on. Okay. Oh. 
What's your answer with this one? I, I think I'm team one and a half. Or... Me too. That's exactly. I mean. Oh. oh, the users have spoken. All right. We've been this, so it's good to see some feedback. It looks like a lot of people are one and a half or two. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I'm surprised we didn't have a shorter option. Yeah. So Alteryx user group, we're sticking with an hour. And it, it goes by really fast, but it's hard virtual. So here we go. Yeah, virtual. All right, guys, get your fingers ready. The very first Tableau conference took place in was in New York City, Seattle, San Francisco, Las Vegas. You have five seconds to answer. And don't forget, the faster you answer, the higher your points. Yeah, so Karen, you were there, right? Oh, yeah, I was there. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> I missed that one. I didn't even I know what Tableau Dan was. Murray was actually there, though. I think Dan was there. I think that's the story of, like, Dan meeting Andy. That's true. All right, Zach S. coming in quick. All right, Zach, it's on you to, to hold that lead. I don't know if you can do it. Here we go. So which Tableau com competitor pulled a publicity stunt with the tagline, Escape Tableau Hell? Oh, I remember that. E16. Was it Zysense? The Click? Tipco? Domo? Power BI? Yes, yeah, so this one was me. Uh, okay. and I added the subpar. subpar. Sorry, sorry for any Domo fans out there. But the parties <laughs> were not subpar. Was it? Who, who was it? Flow Rider was that one? Flow Rider. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. This is in I, Austin. I touched Flow Rider. Yeah. Yep. I I did not get into the um the Snoop Dogg though, unfortunately. All right, Zach What's S. Snoop Dogg, yeah, he did it during Day to Night Out, and it was packed. And there was a special aroma coming from that building. All right. Which format would you use to hard code a date value into a Tableau count? This is testing your Tableau know-how. Went with some date themes because of the Apple event on Tuesday. They released the Apple Watch and all that. I don't know. No grasping. Good question. All right. Yeah. So what? Are, well, okay. So quotes. That's that's a good uh, good guess. So the quotes you would do if it was a string, but if we want Tableau to interpret the value as an actual date, we need to use the uh, what's the real name for that hashtag? And percent or uh no no just say hashtag pound sign hashtag. Hashtag pound hashtag date hashtag pound sign pound sign I my wife is uh, making lunch in the background and she she beat me to it all right let's see who's who's taking the lead Ooh, Zach L holding strong nice all right you guys ready for the next question which of the following is not a valid daytime operation in Tableau. Date trunk, is date, date add, date subtract. All right, you guys know your Tableau, that's good. Date subtract is not a valid calculation. If you wanted to do a date subtract though, you would just do a date add with a negative value. All right, here we go. Zach L, wow, impressive. Rachel W though, crawling her way up. Only a couple more questions. Tableau 2020.3 introduced which of the following features? Only one, you can only pick one. I didn't actually know this one. The answer is 
union spatial files. Yeah, so the noodle, I believe, was 2020.2, right? Or 2020.1. Right. I was thinking it was noodle. Yeah. It's 2020.2. Okay. Yeah, I feel bad for all the folks who are like, you know, one of my clients were on 2018.2 or something. And so I feel bad for all the folks who don't get to use all these cool new features. But uh, unioning spatial files, if, if that gets you excited, then 2020.3 <laughs> is for you. <laughs> all right. Do you ever union spatial files in your day-to-day, -day, Karen? No. 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 You, I, I mean, I haven't had a need for it. I'd be interested to know how many people, like, ATUG folks have. Yeah. Yeah, it, I guess it, it gets rid of the need to, like, let's say you have a spatial file for every county or something, and you need to union every single county together, so you have, like, a tapestry of, I mean, Tableau has that built in, but if you had like a bunch of different areas that you wanted to combine together, you wouldn't have to use like an Alteryx to do it. You could do it directly in Tableau. So that's pretty cool. Or All different right. trade areas would be another one. Yeah. It's like different customer bases, see them all in one map. That would be cool. All right, Rachel W. See if you can hold your lead. Where will this 2020 Tableau conference be held? If you guys were paying attention. And we are so excited to see you in Seattle, Vegas, Atlanta, wherever you are. This one should be a gimme. Nice. Wherever you are and whatever you're wearing. So I will definitely be wearing PJs. It's going to be great. Man. Nice, Rachel W, holding strong. Last question, everybody ready? Here we go. Who headlined Data Night Out at TC18 in New Orleans? Is it Walk the Moon? Robert DeLong, Eminem, Trombone Shorty? Was it Carl Redette? All right, and our final answer is Trombone Shorty. That was a cool, cool show. That was one of the best musical performances I've ever seen in my whole life. <laughs> yeah. Nelson, I have a, a sweet Frida? memory of us, arm in arm. Do you uh, guys remember the well. Big Frida performance? What's that? The Big Frida performance. Uh, yeah, that was special. <laughs> All right, let's see who our final winner is. In third place, JS. Rachel W. And Nelly D. Wow, sneaking it in. Nelly D. I feel like we've seen Nelly D. Yeah. All right, so if you are on this podium, please send the panelists a message with your email address. And, uh, you know, we'll give you some kudos. And maybe send you some money. There we go. That was awesome. As always. Next up, we've got Carl, right? Indeed. That's the rumor. Let me get a slide for us. I had, again, some technical difficulties, but we are, we are back, and we're going to cook with hot oil on this one. Karen, why don't you introduce Carl for us? Okay, so Carl is going to share with us um, – some portals that he's built. Carl works at Innerworks, um, previously worked for Chick-fil-A. He is now a solutions lead at Innerworks. Um, go for it, Carl. We'll be, we'll be monitoring the questions and we'll just pop in if we have any questions. Aaron cool. Nelson, I'll stop there. Yep. you're good. Thanks guys. And hello data family. It's been a minute since I've been able to attend. Um, so I'm just glad to be here. And I feel like I'm following Trombone Shorty after the great presentations we've had. Um, Nelson, like you, I really enjoyed that. That was, that was one of the highlights of that New Orleans conference. So today, folks, we're gonna be talking about higher levels. We've, we've dive, we dove deep into analytics and, and uh, Kelly's presentation was fantastic and the tips from Nathan and Nelson. So now we're gonna pull back up and talk more about uh, why do we do 
dashboarding? Why do we do the things we do? Uh, really, it's to help businesses create value and to make decisions and to change. And so we're going to talk a little bit about, about some stuff we've done at Interworks. Before then, though, I'm going to I'm going to do some polling here. We're going to make this a little interactive. I know this is the second session. Folks are ready to disengage. You're ready to get back to whatever you were doing and uh, go walk the dog or go check email or, or get an afternoon snack. Um, you can go to this link right here, or I'm about to switch my screen as well. Um, we're going to have some interactive polling here through my presentation. Um, I'm going to go pretty quickly through the main content because what I want to get to today is the demo. Um, so if I go real quickly through the slides, don't worry, I'm going to provide them in a PDF format to Jen afterwards so she can share them with you. So um, hang on to your seats here because we're going to go quickly in the remaining time that we have. Let's, let's flip over to our polling. So uh, the first question is just getting a poll of the audience is how long has your organization been using Tableau? So you can vote via text, you can vote via web, however you choose to vote. Um, that is just giving us, giving us a feel for where everybody is in the audience on, um, on their experience. And if you try to vote and it blocks you, it's because this is a free account I just set up and only allows 25 votes per poll. So sorry, I didn't pay for the, the full version yet. Looks like we got a pretty experienced audience um, coming in. So that's fantastic. Uh, that'll, I think you guys will kind of get where we're at on this talk uh, we're about to go. Let's go to the next question. Um, on a scale of one to five, with five being the highest level of engagement, how well do you think Tableau is enabled across your organization? Um, that would be, uh, I think this is really important as we think about all the great content we put in, if we, we take some of those incredible tips that Nelson and Nathan shared with us today, but if it's not engaged, if people aren't using it, it's almost like that if a tree fell in the woods question that we like to ask. Uh, this is actually a big challenge uh, across organizations with data and analytics. If people aren't using it, it's not really providing the value you need it to. I'm going to give you guys uh, a little bit more time here to vote, I'm getting to see some of these answers come in. We got some fun questions at the end too, so stay around for the end. There will be some fun I, questions. I, I'm, I'm struggling to get to the next screen. So I like did one. What? How do I get to the next one? I don't have a button for that. I've got to activate it. So that's a good question. I I thought it would automatically advance you. Maybe you have to stop and do it again. I hit a refresh. And yeah, maybe hit refresh. If you're on the web browser, hit refresh. Thanks for saying something, Nelson. I, even hitting refresh, it took me back to the first one. I'm not sure. Hmm. But I'll keep recording. Okay. We got a few that are coming through. So the, ne the next question here is, what's keeping you from basically saying Tableau is evangelized completely throughout the organization? Uh, is it hard to find content? Is it data governance, data quality issues, or data literacy? Um, is it uh, legacy reporting systems? That's uh, starting to take the lead here in our voting security policies or other internal policies. Yeah, it looks like uh, data literacy is taking the lead. All right, this one I'm not going to answer yet, so we'll, we'll go back to this one in a second. Go back to the presentation here. So some most of you are probably familiar with Interworks. We are a consultancy. We started in 96 with the idea around technology, uh, really more old school, so to speak, IT, networking, telecom, servers. But in the mid-2000s, a guy named Dan Murray in Atlanta uh, started up the BI practice at Interworks. And, and uh, we worked with all kinds of uh, clients of sizes. We love working with small, we love working with large clients. Um, and we've been working with Tableau since the mid 2000s. And uh, we've been working with Snowflake and Alteryx and DataIQ and DataRobot or some other partnerships as well. What we love to do is we love to say we're a people focused consultancy. We love focusing on delivering great value for and, and, and creating strong relationships with you guys. And we do everything on the data and analytics stack. So if you need training, we can help. Um, and infrastructure, analytics, all that. So if we talk about business solutions, 
what does it take to create a great business solution for data and analytics? I'm gonna take a specific example. Most of you know I've spent 18 years prior to Interworks at two different restaurant companies uh, based in Atlanta. Um, so that's really what I'm going to talk about uh, uh, today is, is taking this example of restaurants and retail and, and using that use case to frame our, our conversation today. Um, common challenges in analytics with, with restaurants and retail outlets. They're mature companies, but they tend to lag in technology. They've been around for a while, they understand their business, they gotta deliver either great food with great service, they gotta deliver great products with great service or, or products at low prices, but that's their business. They're interacting with customers, their business is not technology and analytics, so they tend to be technologically behind, especially the older companies. They're a highly distributed environment, and if you've ever worked with data, this creates a specific paradigm you have to solve for. Lots and lots and lots of point of sale outlets, consolidating the information at each location and consolidating all the locations, maybe rolled up to a, a franchisee concept or rolled up to a, a, a operational hierarchy concept and then into a corporate entity and then analyzing all of that. So there's data replication, data flow challenges you have to solve for. In these types of businesses, there's also lots of user and user types. It could be you're delivering analytics to managers. It could be we're delivering analytics to uh, team members on the front lines. It could be that we're delivering analytics to a CEO or CFO and executive leadership. Um, so there's all different types of users you have to solve for in these companies. I mentioned point of sale in the distributed environment, but that really is a specific thing. Um, and point of sale provides its own unique challenges with data and analytics because transactions have to be finalized before you pull in the data. They can always be changed. There's refunds. There's things you have to deal with with point of sale data. And what I've also seen very common with clients in the space is they fall in a technology stack trap. And what I mean by that is it becomes really easy for a technology leader in these organizations to say, we're just gonna be all one vendor. Uh, we might be, you know, we're gonna be all Microsoft or we're gonna be all Oracle or we're gonna be all whatever it may be. Uh, and it seems enticing on the onset, but when it comes to analytics, this actually becomes a trap. And then talent management. Um, because these companies aren't technologically first, they're delivering service, like we said, it can be challenging to get the right talent to do analytics well. And then now we've got a pandemic. So therefore resources are limited, budgets are getting cut because these companies are facing the public and the public isn't out in the public right now as much as they used to be because we have a pandemic. So these are all the things that are playing into what we're talking about. And then data is just bigger and bigger and bigger um, hitting the drive through and the checkout lines. It's constant data flow left and right uh, for these businesses and, and coming from all different places. Uh, not just traditional point of sale type sources, but it comes from everywhere. So how might we solve for this? <clears throat> we want to leverage the best technology that delivers the results you need that fits your budget and maximizing the talents you have. And then we see Tableau enables all of these things. Um, what we like to say is, is we like to look at a client and say, we want to deliver best of breed technology. That's what you're going to see here with the demo I'm about to show. We've got source data coming. Uh, we call it like bring your own POS. Um, could be ERP data, ag word agnostic there, spreadsheets, whatever. And using the um, uh, APIs available, um, we can migrate data into a database platform like a cloud data warehouse like Snowflake. And that's what you're going to see here is, is the um, demo we're doing is actually on top of Snowflake. And then there you're going to have a live connection um, to an analytics platform like Tableau. Um, all of this is going to be delivered here inside of our custom, uh, what we call a custom portal. We call it a curator now, we've rebranded it. Um, but leveraging Tableau's APIs that they make available, it makes it all uh, easy to access, easy to manage. And then as we, we talked about data literacy was a big problem with our users here. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how this can help with that. So why embedded? Why do we wanna take this? Why won't we just point everybody to the Tableau server? I'm gonna switch over to our polling question again. So we got one more polling question. So this is gonna be a free form um, question. So if you wanna go back into the poll, um, what are some brands that do branded experience really well? That's the question we're gonna throw out here. If you think of brands that um, do a branded experience well, what might those be? Apple, there you go. That's probably most people's first, Coca-Cola. 
the shape of their bottle is unique. Um, and then apples growing, we got a few more apples. Disney, absolutely, Chick-fil-A, uh-huh. See if we get a few more in here as well. The Braves, yep. This is probably supposed to be Atlanta Braves. NFL. Disney's a leader in the clubhouse right now, Home Depot. That's one. Nike. So we, we understand what branding is, right? Let's go back here. This was one of the first ones that came through. I think everybody knows what store this is. Without any sign, without any labels, everybody knows that this is an Apple store, just based on the look and feel, because they have branded it that well. I think most people probably can recognize this store. There's no logo, there's no store name, but based on the red color, uh, based on some of the shapes, based on the I I iconic, um, I can't even say that word, the icons and the end caps, we all understand this is a target. M&M's has a very unique uh, flavor of styling. It's, uh, it's big and bold and in your face and in their stores and that's their brand, but you understand immediately, I'm in an M&M store if you've ever been to one. I think most people understand this, this look and feel in a restaurant space. Um, you got the sacks of potatoes and peanuts uh, available. Well, used to have peanuts available, but when we uh, can get out of the pandemic, you know, places like this, it'll, uh, we'll be able to experience this whole branding experience that Five Guys offers. So embedding your analytics makes it a branded experience. And at my prior life, using a portal really helped engagement. Now that was one thing that some folks answered on the poll was engagement um, was not there uh, for Tableau. So making it look and feel like your organization's analytics really does really does help engagement because people feel like, oh, this is ours. This is another tool I've got to learn. This feels like we actually did this for us. Um, there's also an extensible experience. What's one thing that Tableau does very well with, with opening up APIs for us to leverage is we can customize the Tableau experience and not be limited to the default experience. Um, you can have customized loading screens. Uh, I don't know if you knew that, but you can customize instead of having the spinning wheel, you can actually, through the APIs, customize that. Um, we can have tutorials. We have clients that take advantage of this that actually uh, will have a tutorial when a dashboard loads. Um, they click on a, a dashboard screen and then here you go, remember this or add notes about um, this dashboard or even have a, a quick demo video on how this dashboard should look uh, and how to interact with it. Um, we can also hide filters and take filters off of the main screen. Um, by what we call, we like to call them sticky filters, but over to the side. And again, this is all just leveraging um, APIs that Tableau has available for us to use. We can also help tell a deeper story. Um, you know, Kelly did an amazing job talking about the story of, of the COVID data that we've been uh, seeing in the state of Georgia here. Data tells us a story and that's when it becomes valuable to the business. And that's when it helps us to make decisions and helps to, to add for insight. So, um, we can actually, using the APIs, uh, either use story points in Tableau or, or using other, other pages in the Tableau dashboard, we can actually have something that's a little more interactive as we browse through a story and provide users with additional context to what they're looking at. So we're going to stop here and now and I'm going to go over to our demo. Um, what we like to call this demo, uh, there we go. So this is, um, this is what we call Interburger. Interburger is a fake restaurant that we developed um, at Interworks. It is a play on our name. Even the logo is a play on our Interworks logo, the little burger there. And this is publicly available. You can go to this site when we're done here. You can go to it and play with it all you like to your heart's content. Um, we have two experiences. If you are my age, you probably remember Choose Your Own Adventure books. And so we kind of have a very light version of Choose Your Own Adventure books. Uh, I'm going to go to the corporate. So the idea here is in, in a restaurant community or in a retail community, you're going to 
either serve up data for a corporate user who wants to look at everything, or you're gonna serve up data to a regional or a franchisee or a restaurant owner user. So we'll, st we'll start with the corporate experience and then you're gonna immediately see um, some of the features that you can do. Um, branding, we got a nice little bouncy gift here. Hey, while you're waiting instead of the spinning wheel, let's look at our fun Into Burger logo bouncing around. And then we're just gonna land on a, on a landing page. And by, again, by using the APIs that Tableau offers, um, we can customize this landing page. We can have, we have some clients that actually have a lot of different uh, dashboard icons, um, whether they're shapes or circles or whatever. Uh, they might have a, a grid that you might pick from. Hey, I wanna go to this dashboard. Here we've, we've chosen to land on more of an executive dashboard um, that can give an overview to the business for, for anybody who lands in here. Um, and I can scroll down and get a little bit deeper analysis. We've even leveraged uh, Tableau's um, projection and, and prediction capabilities here to say, hey, we're not quite through September, but we're projecting 12 million transactions in September. So it gives an idea of what it could be. And, and, and uh, Nelson and, and Nathan showed some great visual tips. And we've done some similar things here by creating some custom buttons. And all this is just something that that is at our tool tips and at our, not tool tips, that's a bad word to use in a Tableau community, but um, it's at our fingertips to be used here. A couple things I wanna point out is um, we embed, um, we wanna create a user experience that allows the user to easily interact with analytics. And I found that in my prior life, the general managers in the restaurant and then the executives, both were the two hardest audiences to serve up Tableau to. Um, executives would want to get stuff real quickly or they might squirrel around in the Tableau server where the middle management and the, the folks that are creating content understood how to interact with Tableau server real appropriately. And then the, the restaurant users, we didn't want them in Tableau server. We just wanted them to see the information they needed to see, make their decision to run the restaurant and move on. So that's why a, a, an embedded experience was important to us and this was at my prior life. Um, but one thing that was important to me, especially for the executives, was the search. Because when you search in Tableau server right now, you get workbooks, you get uh, uh, views, you also get data sources, you, you might get users. So the search is so robust, but if I start looking in here, oh, what's that drive through sales report? I remember Carl sharing me that drive through sales report. I can just come in here and search for drive through sales. And now I've got just the dashboard. So this actually will limit the search to what you want your users to actually see and interact. And we talked about data literacy being an issue. Think about using icons like this um, in a dashboard and landing in a, in a branded experience. If someone's new to your company, they might not understand that order time is actually the time a car sits at the order point in a drive through They might think it's the entire order time. Well here, just by using a simple icon in the dashboard, we've actually helped enable data literacy. Uh, same with window time, it's pretty clear. Okay, it's the time the car spends at the window getting their food delivered to them. And again, we've got just, just dashboards that you would be familiar with in Tableau. A couple other things I wanna point out here, um, just in this example, um, we, we can actually leverage uh, a report builder. So maybe there's uh, when we can travel again and your executives need to get on an airplane, um, they might not be able to consume Tableau on the airplane or maybe they um, just not gonna be in a good Wi-Fi. We can actually capture um, dashboards here inside of, inside of the, the portal. Um, and we can actually do more than just one dashboard. Instead of just exporting the whole dashboard and all the sheets in it, we can actually create um, slide by slide. And I'll show you how that works here in a second. Maybe I wanna go look to see where are my restaurants located. Um, again, this is a made up, made up restaurant chain. We got roughly 5,000 um, locations in this made up chain. And maybe I wanna see all the restaurants I've got in New York City. And I can scan through here and say, okay, that's where that restaurant's located and that's where I need to contact them. So maybe I wanna take this shot too. I can capture that. And you can see I've got a template already loaded in, the, in our portal, our standard um, brand template for PowerPoint. Um, so I'm just, again, we're just using the APIs. Um, we're loading this in and now we can actually export this as PowerPoint. And it's gonna download that as a PowerPoint tool. And I'll have, I've got a PowerPoint loaded down here. And there we go. We got those two different shots. So that's something that can be really useful, especially for upper management, if they need to present something remotely and they don't have good access to your, your environment. 
Um, I know we're getting close to time here, so I want to, I'll move quickly again on, on some other things. We talked about we're in a COVID era. Something we also wanted to throw out there, um, just as a thought provoking thing, again, you can come in here and play with us later, is we created a, what looks like a, a seating chart. So we, we found a generic, um, a generic seating, restaurant seating chart um, that was available. And, and imagine this is one of our interburger restaurants. And what we were able to do was um, map each seat um, using a, it's a tool that we have out there called drawing tools that you actually can get to as well, which allows you to take a map or an image in and create data out of it. And so what we've done is said, hey, if, if you've got a six foot requirement to be a part, let's go to current state. So this is 100%, I've got 232 seats in this restaurant. All of these are violating my six foot distance rules except for the two at the bottom. So maybe I need to make sure every single seat is six feet apart. So if I do, these are the seats that should be open and I've got two different configurations, A or B, right? And over here, I've got 94 seats used in this configuration. So I've lost 59%. Well, that represents um, $326 dollars in sales um, every day that I'm losing. So therefore, I need to generate 11 more cars in the drive through to make up for that, those sales if I want to keep my same uh, revenue going. I also have the concept here of groups. So assuming every group that comes in can sit together, uh, we could just isolate tables instead of seats. And in this case, we can actually sit seat a few more. And there's a uh, obviously a help guide with this. We're leveraging tool tips to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Last thing I'll show is sometimes it's hard for us to create content um, for some really on demand questions. Um, some of you may have used Ask Data. It came out in 2019.1. And Ask Data is, is Tableau's natural language uh, interactivity. Um, the nice thing about Ask Data is uh, ask data it can hit any data set. So the data set you've seen all these dashboards so far hit. <clears throat> um, this is the same data set. So maybe there's a leader in your organization, you're in a meeting, you don't have a dashboard that answers the question. Let's, let's say the chief marketing officer, she says, hey, I think we, I think we did drive through sales last quarter in Texas. I think it was at this level. But your dashboard doesn't necessarily answer that, but you know the data is there. Well, we could go ask that. So what were drive through sales Texas last, must be last month. And I may not know, if I'm a user, I may not know which columns to hit, right? So we talk about data literacy again. Um, sales, well, there's a column called sales. That was pretty easy for Tableau to determine. But I typed in last month, there's no like month field. I said, oh, there's a business date. Maybe that's the one you want to use. So Tableau. I took business date in the last month. I typed in Texas. That could have been a district. That could have been any level of the hierarchy, but Tableau said that's a state name. Let's start with state. And then especially this is impressive too, that Ask Data can do this drive-through. Um, my destination column is where drive-through sits. And we can go over here and actually Ask Data will show some, some data values that we can break down. Um, similar to if you've ever used Tableau Prep, it gives you a little bit of a data preview. Um, but the nice thing here is it actually, I didn't have to tell it which columns to look at. I just asked the question and I was able to determine that. And maybe we'll look at this by day part. And I can add that to it. And I could keep going and drilling and asking the next question. So if you have users that not, don't necessarily have a dashboard answering the question, this is an easy way to really add value quickly is by leveraging Ask Data. And obviously everything you create in here can also be moved into a dashboard at some point. Um, the last thing I'll show on the demo, and I know there might be some questions coming up, so I want to allow for some questions and the fun questions too, which you guys are going to answer for us. Um, remember, we talked about corporate and franchisee. So look at here, we've got 5,286 restaurants in our, in our chain here, in this Inch the Burger chain. Um, well, if I'm going to go and maybe I'm a... Um, Maybe I'm a franchisee user. So this is the same dashboard. So you only have to create this dashboard once. It's the same, same portal. I'm just logging in as a different user. I'm gonna log in as that franchisee user. 
And you'll see actually using row level security and using the APIs, all it's doing is it's logging in as a different user and it's gonna serve up on the same portal only the data that this franchisee needs to see. So that really reduces development time. So you can see now we've got 626 right here. The same workbook, everything's the same on the back end, just using row level security. And that can really help in a, in a concept in your business with that. So let's go back to Here, looks like Disney was our winner on branding. All right, so we're gonna have some fun questions here. Then we'll then we'll go back to um, go back to the uh, PowerPoint deck. So let's activate this question. So who wins the fry battle? And this is, uh, this is kind of what I thought would come out, but I'm surprised Arby's didn't get any votes. Um, I've done this poll before and uh, a similar one, not the exact same one. And usually it's um, Chick-fil-A falafel fries is number one and, and Arby's is number two in these polls, but that's is usually how it turns out. All right, let's do the next one because we got to get on here. It's, uh, we're almost at time. <clears throat> All right, so if you're stuck on an island, and you can only take one popular restaurant food item with you, what would it be? So this is open-ended, keep it clean, keep the answers clean. So interested to see, and I know everybody's really hungry now. So I know we're done with this call. You're gonna hop straight to your afternoon snack, I'm sure. Or if you're joining outside Atlanta, maybe it is lunchtime for you. So let's see what you guys would. Cheeseburger, Chick-fil-A nuggets, Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich. So we gotta zoom in on this, this is so small. Chick-fil-A tenders, pizza, sweet green salad. I'm not familiar with that one. Margarita, there you go. Checker burger. Spicy nuggets. Hey Karen, when's Chick-fil-A getting spicy nuggets? Oh man. <laughs> I know that we're testing spicy nuggets or the last I heard there was a test, but I don't know. I'm not sure. I wish we had them now because I could go for some spicy nuggets. I saw you guys are testing pimento cheese somewhere and that would sound amazing. <clears throat> Karen's getting accused of voting multiple times. Actually, I made it so you cannot vote multiple times. Um, so. I tried. It didn't work. <laughs> yeah, I made it so you can only vote once. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed, um, you know, these fun questions too. It certainly makes, uh, it certainly makes this kind of presentation, you know, a little more interactive and, and to think about it. So let's get back to our deck. So making it happen, <clears throat> what you just, just saw there, and sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, you can do this yourself. Like I said, we use just leverage the APIs in, in the curator product that we uh, built at, at Interworks. Um, the cost for you is your time. Uh, it requires web development knowledge and, and, uh, Tableau provides, <clears throat> excuse me, excellent documentation on how to leverage the JavaScript API or the REST API, but that's really what it comes down to. So um, DIY, and if you want to purchase, um, there's, we're not the only partner that does this, so just be transparent. There's lots of other partners uh, that also produce a similar type tool, um, but I would encourage you, if you do want to purchase, go with a partner that you uh, know and, and have a good relationship with and that has a deep knowledge of those Tableau APIs. Um, that will certainly shorten the time to results. So when you purchase, you're gonna get the results faster or at least you should. So, and here's some highlights for the, the, the curator product at Interworks that we have. So I just, you guys can get this in the deck later if you wanna review it. So again, thank you guys for attending this afternoon on a, on a rainy, stormy day here in Atlanta. And if you're not in Atlanta, wherever you're at, I'm really glad to see you guys are all here and, and um, wish everybody here in the Data family um, health and and that you're all doing well so we'll open up for a few questions now we've got one carl um we've got a question are there apis to access the ask data engine 
There is, there are some, um, really it's more for embedding. Um, so you can actually embed the, like that search of Ask Data in, um, I've not, I, I would have to ask our team on that if they have done any actual like, hey, can you write an API to ask that specific question? So that's a really good question. So I don't know the answer to that one, but I do know there's API available to have access to it and to embed it. If you want to embed it a little differently than the way I did. I did the easy embed on that portal. I just said, hey, embed link, paste it into my web browser, you know, editor tool, and I'm done. That's how easy it is. But there is ways to do just the search bar, so. And can you remind everyone what API could be used to get to the search button? Um, it's more than likely going to be the REST API, but again, I'd have to dive into it. I'm the one that wrote it, so it's more than likely going to be the REST API. Um, usually Tableau exposes everything in JavaScript and REST, but I'll find out the answer and I'll put it in the um, um, follow-up with our stuff. Perfect. Do we have any more questions? Nope. Nelson, you have anything for wrap up? Yes. Let me share my screen. Carl, thank you again. This was great. Yeah, thanks for having yeah. me. It's great to be part of the family again today. I know. So as we wrap it up, um, invite everybody to go ahead and register for the October 29th uh, ATUG. So we got a little bit of time, about five, six weeks between now and then. Uh, we'll have top Tableau conference uh, between now and then as well. So we'll, we'll do that debrief. Um, and then uh, we'll have uh, a, another speaker who will be focused on how to do uh, Tableau training virtually. Uh, so if you find yourself in a position where uh, you've got a team and you still need to kind of continue to increase the, the knowledge and the capabilities of your team, uh, in this virtual world. Uh, we've got some folks who've got some great advice on that. So uh, excited about that. And then uh, Karen, just uh, a bunch of people to thank. Yes, definitely. Um, we want to say thank you uh, definitely to Turan for everything he does with YouTube. Please enjoy that uh, Tableau gift card. And Nathan, big thank you for the Kahoot and the design tips and tricks today. You guys did a great job with that. And we have a lot of people listed here from Tableau that we really appreciate everything they do to pull together these Zoom meetings. And of course, Jen um, from Analytic Vision, incredibly helpful putting our meetings together, the splash page. So big thank you to Jen. Awesome. Thanks well, everyone looking, for joining us today. It. Yes, absolutely. We look forward to seeing everybody back uh, in a few weeks and look forward to seeing everybody on Slack as we, uh, as we pull apart the Tableau conference. So awesome. Thanks y'all. Thanks everyone.